So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by the delightful Greg Lipschitz from Melbourne over in Australia. Welcome, Greg. Hi, Deborah. Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure, absolute pleasure. I'm looking forward to hearing what we have to say. I'm, I actually met Greg when we were at a Business Blueprint conference and his talk that he did completely blew me away. And I said, you've got to come and do this on my podcast. I think uh, this is will get a great deal of benefit from it. So Obviously, Greg is um, he's a founder and CEO of Summit Internet, which is a telecommunications company based in Melbourne. He has been a business owner for over 22 years. So 16 years old, left school, went straight into owning businesses and has been running businesses ever since and still going, which is always a good sign. Um, so, Greg, tell us a little bit about your story. Tell us how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, I started off, Deborah, I guess, as a bit of a um, working out of my parents' bedroom. You know, that was kind of the thing. I was a bit of a rebel in my in my early days and school didn't really fit me as that original mold so I would I found business as my calling and started by fixing computers and then went from fixing computers actually was working in radio and my career path was actually originally in radio but I found IT and that kind of dragged me into a different direction altogether and technology was really coming through this was still the days of dial-up internet mind you and bulletin boards and things like that so it was very early internet days And the internet, as we know it today, didn't even exist back then. It was very, very early. And through technology, I ran an IT business for a number of years and managed to exit that. I had a creative design business. We were very early on in website design and dynamic websites and databases and things like that and managed to exit that business. And um, since then, we've been running a telecommunications business where we've actually built a competitor and challenger brand to what we know here as the NBN in Australia or UFB network for those of you New Zealand uh, listeners. And we've got a fixed wireless network that spans over four and a half thousand square kilometers of Victoria and provide that as a completely independent network to all of the other telco companies here in Australia. And we sell that as a, both a retail and a wholesale product to other ISPs. Wow. Okay. That's um. Certainly a, a brave move, I would have thought, a challenger brand for such a large. Yeah, it's a huge, huge space, the telecommunication space. Like we all rely on it these days, especially the last two years, everyone's utilisation of, of internet has shown just how important it really is to have fast internet, reliable internet. And that's really what we focus on is an internet product that doesn't rely on the cables in the ground. We shoot the signal through the air and provide high-speed internet to businesses that really is a completely different experience to what they're used to by having the fiber delivered through the ground. Wow. Okay, cool. So you've got a number of staff, right? So you've got 17 staff um, there in Melbourne and yeah, we've got 17 been... staff. It's um, it's one of those things that you look at and go, wow, how, how do we grow that big? We've actually been as big as 26 over the years, but through implementing systems and implementing some really good technology tools we've managed to um, keep our staff numbers what i would say under control and um, keep the scale and the growth there and we've got uh, three staff for our uh, back of house team in the philippines and they work as our sales administration team okay fantastic so i always like to ask my guests to give me a little bit of a, a professional and personal best now you've obviously done quite a lot in your sort of 22 years in business but tell me a little bit about your what you are most proud of in business oh look I think in, in business, growing and maintaining a high-performing team is probably the, the most proud thing, being able to see that I can step out of the business and the team continues to strive and, and achieve amazing things even without me. That's certainly one of those things that, you know, you look at it like, you're, like your kids, you, you want to see them grow and succeed. And that really is the same sort of thing with your team. So building a high-performing team is certainly something that uh, I'm probably most proud of in the business sense. And you're saying that you've um, implemented some great systems and processes too to make sure that they actually can can run that business without you. So if you were to go away for a number of weeks, I'm assuming the business will just continue working as if you were there. Is that right? Absolutely. So I actually um, broke my collarbone earlier in the year. Oh, no. And um, I think I was in a sling when we caught up in Fiji. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I stepped out of the business for about six weeks and didn't have to do a thing, could um, walk, walk away knowing full well that everything would run exactly as I was it would expect it to. The sales process runs, the systems runs, the technical support, the billing and accounting. I don't have to sit there and, and micromanage. The, the guys can um, do absolutely everything and I could just sit back and oversee exactly what needs to be done. It's exactly what we want from business, right? Fantastic. Absolutely. You want to be working on the business, not in the business. Not in the business, I completely agree. And tell me about your your personal life. What are you most proud of in your personal well, life? Well, 
got three wonderful children, uh, 16, nine and uh, six years old. So nice, nice uh, age gap there. And um, my partner, Prue. So um, yeah, wonderful family. And uh, I enjoy motorcycle riding outside of uh, work and uh, do a lot with the youth leadership through scouting. So spent a lot of time um, still involved with scouting for 29 years this year. I've gone all the way through uh, Cub Scouts, Ventures, Rovers, and uh, now a leader through through scouting here in Victoria. Nice. And tell me the collarbone, was that related to motorcycles by any chance? No, unfortunately oh. it wasn't. It was uh, ac- accidental stupid feet going uh, A over <laughs> T, walking of all things on a gravel track. It was oh, uh, no. just just complete clumsiness. But um, every day now I watch the footy here in uh, in Melbourne and watch these big, big burly players getting knocked to the ground and go, how come they can't break their collarbones going going over like that? Because that's pretty much all I did. Yeah. Oh, no. Absolute clumsiness. <laughs> well, at least you've got a story to tell. Absolutely. <laughs> Probably more exciting if it was uh, doing something exciting on the motorbike. Mm, fair enough. So when we actually met at the Business Blueprint Conference, you were talking about something completely different to telecommunications. Absolutely. Um, and it was One all of... about travelling up at the pointy end of the plane. Would you like to give us a little bit more insight into that? Yeah, so one of the things, I guess, we all work so damn hard as business owners and we sometimes forget about the things that we can take out of the business that might not be financial reward. It might just be being able to travel in style. So one of the things I focused on over the last uh, 22 years is how can I, I guess, points hack through business and get additional, what we, you know, you call it compensation, you call it benefits, you call it enjoying life. How can you get that out of your business in a different way? So points hacking is um, something that you learn over time. You can, tweak and tune your business processes to be able to go and extract that extra value out of your business so that you can get some personal benefit and reward out of it. And one of those big things is certainly traveling up the pointy end of the plane. So tell us a little bit more about that because you seem to have this sort of down to an art form now in terms of points hacking. Yeah, Yeah, look, it is a little bit of an arts form. So I guess the the first thing really is understanding the difference between uh, points and status. So one of the, the biggest things is points are something that you, you earn by spending. And that might be through a credit card rewards program, or that may be um, by leveraging some of the extra uplifts and the partnerships that the airlines have with products that you use today. So it might be renting a car, for instance, through a partnership with your airline. And that might get you some extra points. And it might also earn you extra status. So points are the things that you earn whereas status are the things that you will get by flying with a certain airline. That's the bronze, silver, gold, platinum that you see. And you might hear them call up um, certain people to board the plane at certain times. So that's the status side of things. It will get you into lounges. You'll get preferential um, treatment when you try and apply for your upgrades. So if you're a, let's just um, give you an example on that one. If you're a bronze member with Qantas, for instance, that's their entry level membership that you kind of get Um, When you sign up, you may not get anything particular for that other than a piece of plastic in your wallet. Whereas if you're at the platinum level and you apply for an upgrade, you may have bought um, an economy fare, standard economy fare, but you've said, okay, I would like to upgrade that, that flight to a business class flight or a first class flight. The higher the status level you are, the more preferential treatment you get when you've actually applied for that. So that's where status comes into play. So it really is a combination between earning the points, but also flying the miles to get the status. Right. And I know that when you first opened up your talk in in Fiji, you mentioned the fact that a lot of us have got credit cards and things that are linked to things like flybys or um, those sort of things. And I always thought that was a really great idea because you could get these, you know, wonderful things from your flyby store for for doing nothing. But it's not always the best idea, right? No, look, converting um, points into things like toasters, kettles, coffee machines, or a fancy new iPhone is probably the worst use of points. So if you're actually trying to get um, points that you can redeem into flights, that's the best way to do it. When you look at the conversion, one point is effectively equal to about one cent. So if you've gone and earned yourself 300,000 points, you're only getting about $3,000 worth of value. Mm -hmm. And you see people like um, ANZ Bank this week has just announced when you sign up for a home loan with them, you get 300,000 points. Now it sounds like a really big number, right? Yeah. But when you look at that on your home loan, you go, oh, that's only $3,000 to change your home loan. Is that really good value? 
Well, that's the same thing with your points. You've got to look at it and go, do these points actually convert to a tangible object in a really good way? If I've spent $300,000, but I'm only getting $3,000 of value, is that good value? Mm. Whereas if I've spent $300,000, but I'm getting a $12,000 one-way first class ticket, well, that might be better value. So you can see that the uplift by using the points with the airlines is certainly better. So what do you recommend? So in terms of points, look, my, my preference on points is always um, having an American Express card. The American Express business cards certainly provide for excellent points yield. So that's the number of dollars you spend converted into points. So on a business card, for instance, you typically get um, two points for every dollar. Mm -hmm. Some of them are two and a half points just really depends on what you're spending and where you're spending. Things like the um, Australian tax officer, get, for instance, if you pay your ATO bill on your American Express, you get about half a point. So you've just got to look at where your points yield is going to come from and where that value is going to come from. Mm -hmm. The um, other thing to have is, of course, if people don't accept American Express, which I'd implore businesses to, of course, take it if they don't already and speak to American Express about reducing the merchant service fee. But Something like a Visa card or, an, or a MasterCard um, issued via an airline is usually what's going to give you the best points yield because they are going to give you those uplifts and those kickers for signing up with them. Okay. So you, would you actually recommend them having both an Amex card and a Visa or MasterCard linked to a, um, an airline program? Yeah. So, so you're covered in all... All so places. the American Express card, I would recommend getting an American Express issued card. So that's not something like a Qantas card. That would be something that you would directly apply for with American Express. In regards to the Visa or the MasterCard, either a bank issued card with a good rewards program or an airline that you would fly with regularly that has a good points yield return on that card. Okay. And then, and then you've got things like linking. You mentioned before around linking to get the, those benefits. So in Australia, we've got things like flybys where you can actually link your flybys card to your Virgin Australia, and then you can get status credits for spending. So usually you only get status credits for flying, but um, the flybys partnership actually gives you 10 points per month maximum um, to, for, do, for doing nothing except spending. So if you shop at Coles or Woolies or Bunnings or any of these stores that are uh, affiliated with flybys, you can get status credits for just shopping. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Especially after, after the last two years, no one's really been flying. So maintaining status has been uh, one been of those. really difficult. It's right, really, yeah. really difficult. And then a, bit, a big thing that we hear all the time, and I've touched on it before, is we don't take American Express. So there's other ways to, to get that value. And one of them is certainly linking it to something like PayPal. So you can say to a lot of businesses, hey, do you accept PayPal? And they go, yeah, yeah, we accept PayPal. It's like, great. So linking your American Express card to your PayPal account and then paying them on your Amex via PayPal is what can actually yield you a lot of points as well. So it's getting a little bit creative about where you use it and where you link it to get that most value. Perfect, love it. Any other good tips? Yeah, look, if you've, if you've got um, people who say, you know, we, we don't want to um, take American Express, but we'll give you 30-day credit terms or 60-day credit terms, ask them what the cost of money is. Because in business, we all know cash flow is king and cash is queen, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of businesses go, yeah, we'll give you 60-day credit terms unsecured. And you might pay them in 61, 62, 90, 120 days. But what's the cost in their business of actually providing you that cash credit term? So 17% is about the average going rate these days of an overdraft and then managing that and then the collections process and all of that. Whereas they could go to American Express, take merchant fees, pay about 1.5 to 1.8% and get next day business settlement. Fantastic. Now you, you were saying before to you, they actually are open to negotiating those fees too, aren't they? Because oh, we assume absolutely. that they're stone. Yeah, so, so years, years ago, they were sort of around that 3.5%. And even these days, you've effectively got two, um, two rates. You've got the interchange rate, which is what the banks effectively pay to have um, the, the transactions going through. Yeah. And then you've got the fees that the banks put on top of it to account for these rewards programs. So Visa and MasterCard, the interchange rate's about um, 0.3 of a percent. And then the bank's going to put sort of half a percent on that to make their money. And then the base rate's about that 0.7 to 0.9. Hmm. Then 
you've got on top of that things like if you've got a gold card, if you've got a platinum card, or if you've got a super duper platinum card, what you don't see when you swipe the card is what the merchant actually pays. So your debit cards are going to be around that 0.7% because there's nothing really attached to it. Whereas your super duper gold platinum rewards card, the merchant often will pay anywhere between 1.8% and 2.9% just for you having that card because someone along the line has to pay for those rewards fees. Sure. American Express, they charge anywhere between about 1.3% and 2.5% to you as the merchant. But again, comes back to, are you going to pass that on? And how much volume are you doing? So if you're a small business who does say $10,000 a month on your merchant services, you might be paying 1.8%. If you're a business that's doing a lot of transactional volume, so we do about $200,000 on our merchant services every month. Ours is down to about 1.5%. Hmm. Now, American Express, of course, are trying to encourage people to use their cards because yeah. it's good for them and it's good for the merchants. So they've actually increased the number of merchants in Australia by about 75,000 in the last 12 months. And they're encouraging that by merchants not charging that fee through to the consumer. Yeah. So if you actually agree not to charge that through to the consumer, American Express will all of a sudden say, oh, well, we'll give you a kicker rate. We'll give you that little bit extra off because you're not going to pass that through. I like it. It's actually really interesting because I assumed Amex was dying. I had an Amex many, many, many years ago, and I assumed it was dying because other people yeah, don't accept it. But you're right. It's definitely back on the increase again, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, American Express, people don't even realize where it started from. But remember those pesky traveler's checks that we all used to go and get when we <laughs> yes. traveled overseas? That's where American Express started. They were a yeah. travel company. They weren't a credit card company. They've just evolved into a credit card company because the way that we transact with money now is the piece of plastic in our wallet, not the, not the traveler's checks that we used to go and get. So American Express, from a travel point of view, they, they've got some great um, programs available things like their foreign exchange program. So again, you can get, if you're transacting overseas and you're buying, say, stock from China, you might do your FX today through your bank. Just by changing the way you do your FX through American Express, you can actually get really good FX rates as well as getting points for doing the business that you'd normally be doing. Yeah. So it's just about changing the way that you think about who you do business with and how you do business that will actually yield you these extra points. Yeah, and I, I have to say that whole thing about you know, the value of cash and what I just is again something we don't have to think about. We get caught up in these little small amounts of you know two three percent of of fees, but yeah, you know, what is the cost of actually having to fund um, yeah cash flow at that time? It's really interesting. Okay, and, and then we've all got as we we touched on earlier, seventeen staff. Well, seventeen staff go out and buy you know milk for the office, or they might yeah. go and buy um, some stuff from Office Works, or they'll take a client out for lunch, or they'll go and buy a cup of coffee. Well, those staff reimbursements that we do have now changed into providing every staff member with a card. So rather than doing reimbursements, they just put in their claims through an app. And all of a sudden, we get that points yield as a business rather than having to do reimbursements. Mm. We've also done some um, work, or I've done some work with another business where we looked at their sales team and we said, okay, what is stopping your sales team going out and having whining and dining and having lunches and and going and actually engaging with with clientele and when we actually got to the crux of the real root cause of the problem it was staff didn't like the reimbursement process that hr and the accounts team had put into play because they would have to go and spend their money mm -hmm. taking the client out whining and dining and That's then get Correct. And then fill out the form and then say, oh, we went to this restaurant and oh, it cost a little bit more than I would normally spend. And oh, it was my money. So, or oh, maybe I don't go to that restaurant next time. And because of that, they, the staff didn't like it. So we're like, okay, so have we turned the sales cycle on its head? And how can we look at the friction points in a sales cycle? And what we worked out was, well, if we remove the friction point of the dollars spend by the salesperson, and we put that back on the business. Well, all of a sudden, they weren't questioning where they were taking the customer. And this was a high, high cost product. It wasn't a transactional you know, pair of headphones or something like that. This was high transactional, high value product. How can we increase that? Well, if we take the client to the nice lunch and we don't have to worry about the bottle of wine and we don't have to worry about the bill at the end, that friction with the salesperson was, was removed and therefore the close time was reduced, something as simple as that, or by providing them a company credit card. 
Yeah, see, I wouldn't have even thought of that. So you're absolutely yeah. right. Also, it would change their whole sort of energy as well in that meeting with the client in terms of not sitting there Correct. worrying about what they're, yeah. Yeah, and and it and it's a, that cultural shift. A lot of people get worried about. Oh, but what if they spend too much? And what if they spend money on the wrong things? Well, that really comes back to your values and your culture and the business. If you trust your staff to do the right thing and they're doing the right thing and they're going to get the right results that are going to benefit the business, well, you've got to have that that level of trust there. If your staff aren't trustworthy, well, you've got to be going. Geez, I don't know. Would I, is that, are they the right person to be doing this with? That's right. But you've yeah. just got to look at your business and go, where are those friction points within, this was a sales cycle. So how can we remove that to increase the sale value and reduce the sales time? Yep. Perfect. And of course, with all the reporting things that comes with these credit cards, it also gives you some fantastic tools to monitor oh, what's absolutely. going on and see what, yeah, what people are doing. Yeah. Itemized billing is now standard across most, most of these sorts of platforms, but then you've got all of the apps now for doing expenses and justification around expenses as well. And, and that holds people accountable. And really it comes back to if people do the wrong thing, you've got to do those, um, have those, com- those hard conversations. And if they do it once you go, look, don't do it again. And if they do it a second time, well, then they're probably going to get us back on the wrist. <laughs> yes. And the third time, well, who knows? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They, they might not be the right, the right person to be in your business. The other thing that we really love with um, having the points is being able to reward based on giving people holidays. And we look at that as a business and you go, you know, we, we give everyone four weeks of annual leave a year in Australia. What could we do to increase the value of the relationship, not only with the employee, but with their family. Hmm. And if you say to an employee, Hey, I know you're looking at taking some time off and going to Queensland. How about we pick up the tab for the airfares as the business. You just let me know when you want to travel and the flights you want to go on and we'll pick up the tab for those flights. Now, to the employee, they sit there going, oh my God, you're amazing. That's just saved me, you know, two to $3,000 off my holiday bill. To you as the business, what's it really cost you? Well, it hasn't cost you anything. It's cost you, it's bought you some loyalty, absolutely. But in terms of the spend, you've already spent the money, you've already got the points. All you now need are doing is banking those points and getting a hell of a lot of that loyalty back from your staff. And that makes a huge difference. Fantastic. I didn't follow that either. That's great. Cool. Any other last little tips that you can do in terms well, of- Well, one of, one of my favorites is, is, of course, access to the, to the lounges. So ah. you can get, you know, some of the best lounges in the world just by having the right cards. Yeah. Um, I do harp on about Amex. I'm not, I'm not paid by American Express <laughs> in any way, shape or form. I should, should just- uh, remind everyone that you've got to go and do your own financial um, investigation on all these sorts of things. This isn't financial advice, but yeah, you do get some amazing lounges as part of some of these programs. One of my favorites is certainly the, the uh, Amex lounge in Hong Kong. Yep. Um, beautiful, fully stocked bar there. Um, great facilities. And that's really what it comes down to. A lot of these long flights we go on, all we want to do is have a clean toilet and a shower and somewhere to sit down and have a cup of coffee. And that's really what some of these beautiful lounges provide. You're not sitting out in the uh, the lounge, uh, in the um, waiting hall, waiting for your next flight and paying exorbitant amounts for food and drink. So you do get some really great benefits there. So if somebody is considering kind of changing things around, switching things up a little bit to see what better benefits they can actually get, where would you suggest that they start? Yeah, look, uh, what I would suggest is go and have a look at the rewards programs that are out there in your country. Um, Every country has different um, programs that they have available. So American Express don't run the same rewards programs across all of their countries. They are very similar, but they don't actually run the same programs across all of their countries. Um, If you're in Australia, you can certainly use uh, my referral, which is bit.ly forward slash get Amex points. And um, I'm I'll give you that link to pop in the show notes as well. Uh, at the moment, you get a bonus 300,000 points just by signing up, which is a really great way to get started. But there's certainly some amazing um, programs that are in all of the countries um, with American Express on their business programs. And they'll offer you upfront rewards to get started. And especially if you, I know that they were offering a linking of your merchant services as well. So if you picked up as a merchant, they were getting, giving some additional points there as well which is really useful to get started. But start um, looking at different websites around points hacking. If you just Google points hacking, there's some great resources in in all the different countries and all the different regions around the different airlines. Of course, every airline is going to have their different alliances with different things like car rental companies, hotels, accommodation. But look at where you spend your money today 
and look at how you may change your spending habits to get you the biggest rewards. That may, may be something as simple as changing where you put petrol in your car. So it doesn't, doesn't stop you putting petrol in your car. It just means rather than going to Shell, you might go to BP. Rather than going to BP, you might go to 7-Eleven. And it's just looking at which one's going to yield you the best points return, which means you get to fly up the, up the pointy end more. Excellent. That's really good. Hey, um, look, I always ask my guests to kind of finish up with a few top tips for them. And I, and I guess there's a couple of elements for you. First of all, this whole point hacking thing is fascinating, but also as a businessman, you've been through a lot yourself. What would you say are the three top things you could share with our listeners who are oh, look, themselves? In business, I would say um, systems is definitely the biggest thing that will change your life. Yeah. Uh, let go and trust your staff and enjoy business. Have fun. Um, if you feel that you're stressed out and you're not enjoying it, go and talk to someone about that because that, that's a real problem. And I see a lot of business owners get to that point where everything else is working, but the enjoyment factor is not there. And I really think you need to be enjoying every day. You've got to wake up and, and, and want to go to work every day. Yeah. The day that you stop wanting to go to work, have a chat to someone because it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. And you do a lot of work with actually helping people to get the exit strategy together and um, get out of their business if that's what they want to do, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my advisory firm, Six Plus Nine Advisory, we help those businesses go through those different stages, so the build and the scale and the, the exit. And really it's about extracting that value at the end because we all have an end goal in mind. Whenever you start in business, you always go, oh, what's that magic number that someone's going to write on a piece of paper and slide it across the table to me one day? And that's, that's my number. Well, everyone's got that number. So it's about being able to extract the value along the way so that when you get to the exit, you can actually make sure that you're getting that, that value out. So too many businesses focus on the now, but they don't focus on the what's next. But it's still, you know, even if you are planning to sell though, you still want to make sure that you're actually doing what you love every day with people. Oh, absolutely. Love. Because there's different, different roles you can play within the company. If you're not enjoying the role you're playing within it, what else could you be actually doing? Absolutely. Do, yeah. do the things that you enjoy doing. And if you don't enjoy it, systemize it and get someone else to do it. Love it. Okay. And certainly so on the point side of things, look, understand your cash flow and uh, the way that you can points hack your business. Don't buy irons and toasters. That's certainly the, you know, the number two. And use your points. You collect all these points. Go and use them. Don't just sit on them. When you've got millions and millions of points and you're sitting there looking at it, go and use your points and go and um, have a lovely holiday. Book up the pointy end. Go and experience some of these um, first class uh, trips out there. There's some amazing rewards that you can go and get. And you'd probably go and fly there, you know, maybe once or twice in your lifetime. But yeah. Go and enjoy it. You've worked yeah. hard for it. So where's your where's your favourite place that you've actually flown to? Oh, look, Singapore would probably have to be one of my favourites. I've, I've really enjoyed Singapore. Okay. Um, uh, Hong Kong was probably another one. I spent um, a couple of layovers in Hong Kong, but also made sure that I had some time to go and walk the city. And so between Singapore and Hong Kong, it was probably probably the favourite. Both both culturally and uh, just, yeah, just, just so, you know, the... The dynamics of the of the countries. One thing that fascinated me in Hong Kong was the OHS that we apply here in Australia mm -hmm. versus what they apply there is completely different. We've got amazing scaffolding and OHS, and they were using bamboo poles and sticks yes. still. And it was that um, acceptance of risk. And I look at that as business owners, and we accept risk every day. That's just one of the things we have to do. And that was fascinating to me to go, yeah, this is this is their acceptance of risk. But also I think there's an element of like the, the personal responsibility as well. I mean, because uh, no matter what you use as your scaffolding, it's the fact that the people are actually bought into making sure they're looking after themselves, right? Because that's all the same thing when I went over there and you sort of think, wow, but in actual fact, they're just, they don't have any more accidents because of it. No, no, no they, they, they probably um, are safer because yeah. they're aware of their surroundings and aware of the risk. Exactly, cool. Hey, so if anybody wants to get in contact with you, Greg, what would be the best way to get hold of you? You can email me, hello at sixplusnine.com or you can find me on LinkedIn. Perfect. And so your surname is spelt L-I-P-S-C-H-I-T-Z. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Hey, well, look, thank you so much for your time. Like Thanks, I said, Deborah. when, I, when I looked at this um, at the Business Blueprint Conference, it's like, wow, um, there's definitely a better way. And you don't actually have to change much to realize the benefits. I mean, we're still buying the petrol. We're still buying the same things we'd normally buy. We're still accepting payments from people. It's just using that to the best possible advantage, right? Absolutely. And in a lot of the times it can actually improve and streamline your cash flow as well because you're doing things in a in a more systemized way. Yeah. Great. Hey.
Hey, look, Greg, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for sharing your tips. My um, pleasure, Deborah. Look forward to putting them in action myself. <laughs> Thanks very much. Cool. Thank you.